Doink. It, wow, that kicked in awfully well. I'm going to set that there. That was completely improvised. I had no idea that was going to happen. Uh, how's your first day of SOCAP going so far? Good? Because we got two thumbs up here. We've got a lot of noise going on elsewhere. Uh, before I do anything else, uh, because I'm an improviser and we're used to interacting with the audience, I want to have you guys do a little improv game with each other, a very little game. So everybody stand up. Everybody stand up for just a moment. And uh, if you're sitting by yourself, get moved to uh, find somebody else that you can work with. This is a two-person game. doesn't matter whether you know them or you're just meeting them for the first time. And I want you to turn and face that person. And I want you to just very simply go back and forth counting up to three. So it'll go one, two, three, one, two, three. And try to do it as quick as you can. Don't worry about getting it right. The goal of this exercise is how fast you can do it. Make mistakes, skid out of control. If you, you know, completely screw up your numbers and go to five, that's okay. This does not go on your permanent record. Just go back and restart, okay? So go ahead and start. And see if you can push yourself to go even faster, more f uh, faster than you're comfortable with. Okay, okay, now we're going to change it up a little bit, because one of the things in improv that we do is anytime something gets easy, we actually make it hard. So you have to reach for that next bar, you have to try a little harder. So instead of counting one, two, three, we're going to place one with a clap. So it'll go clap, two, three, clap, two, three. And again, see, push yourself to go even faster. Make mistakes. Go for it. Okay, great. Now we're going to change it up again. We're going to add another little change to this. So instead of two, we're going to add a stomp. So it'll go. Three, okay? And again, go as fast as you can. Okay, great, we're gonna up the game one more time. So instead of three, now you're gonna say, woo! Okay, so go, woo! Okay, go for it. Terrific, terrific. Thank your partner. Thank your partner for helping you out there. And go ahead and sit back down. Uh, that's a little game we play to warm up before shows, that our cast does before shows, that we teach students to go, that we change the focus from trying to get one, two, three right, because we could do that very easily, right? We could kind of, you know, kind of, I always think of it as that badminton game of one, two. You know, we could slow it down and get it right, but we want to change that a little bit. Uh, so, as they had said, I'm Ken Robertson. I'm the Artistic Director of BATS Improv over here in Fort Mason, Building B. We have several sessions that are happening uh, in our theater. Uh, we have been there, uh, have been improvising for 32 years, uh, which is, if anybody's counting, two years longer than The Simpsons. Anytime you can measure yourself favorably in longevity against The Simpsons, I think you're doing something well. Uh, we perform well over 100 completely made-up shows every year meaning we come out very much like this in front of a paying audience and we go, we couldn't be bothered to prepare anything, thanks for the money, let's see what happens. Uh, and we do that many, many times, every Friday and Saturday. And uh, we also have a, a corporate training arm at work that uh, we're working with all kinds of companies from garage startups to uh, Fortune 100 companies working on communication and innovation and teamwork and leadership. Uh, and this is there's been a huge interest and huge expansion in this over the last several years. Now when SOCAP came to us, because is the first time we've had a lot of sessions in the Bats Theater over the years, but we've never actually participated. And when they came to us a couple of weeks ago and said, would you be interested in presenting on this first day of SOCAP, getting the most out of SOCAP, especially something about creativity and creativity with others. How do you put ideas together with other people? Uh, the minute they asked, I said yes. No problem, no hesitation. Uh, that's part of the improv discipline. You probably, if you've heard, anybody heard of yes and, you know, if you think of improv, that's probably the two words that come to mind. Do you want to do this? Yes and. 
but I've also been a performer for a long time. And there's an unspoken rule in auditions that when you go into audition for something, no matter what ridiculous skill they ask you for, you say yes, whether you can do it or not. And the theory being that, it, you know, somebody's, can you juggle five flaming chainsaws on a unicycle? Sure, no problem. Can you, you know, bend space time with just this Cheerio? Yeah, did five times this morning, no worries. Uh, and you say that so you're not immediately eliminated from the audition, and if you don't get the part, you'll never have to learn the skill, and if you do, you'll have time to learn it, or they'll just hire somebody to teach you on the set. But then I thought about that, and I thought, hang on, I am an improviser, I have been creative in some creative field most of my life, but I wanna make sure that I'm not that person that comes out to speak but isn't an authority that doesn't have that experience. I don't want to be the person that recorded a hit single in 1992 and is coming out giving a lecture on how to conquer the music industry, right? So I did a little inventory into my history and said, let me, let me check and make sure that I am indeed creative. And yeah, there was lots of evidence that I was creative. Going back to first grade, the first thing I could remember was uh, there was an impromptu talent competition that our, our first grade teacher threw, and for some reason I was inspired to get up and do celebrity impressions, if you can manage a six-year-old having the gumption to do that. Uh, and my favorite characters were primarily cartoon characters, and I wasn't awful, and the teachers laughed, and my fellow students laughed, and my parents paraded me in front of relatives having them do that for several years, so I must have been doing something at least okay. About 10 years later, uh, when I was in high school, I had been playing trumpet for a number of years, I was a fairly accomplished musician, and I was sitting in the pit band playing for the school musical that year, uh, and I watched three shows of these actors up there, and I went, you know, I think I could do that. And by the end of the year, I was auditioning and playing leads, and by the next year, I was actually playing leads and winning awards. So, great, yeah, wonderful, checklist, I am creative, I got this. But the disturbing part was, that there were equal numbers of examples where I wasn't, where I had complete and total creative failure and paralysis. Has anybody experienced that where you want to do something creative and you just cannot get started? Good, one person, terrific, thank you. Uh, yeah, there were, you know, I, at one point in time I was interested in writing screenplays. And again, I was an actor, I knew scripts, I knew characters, I was gonna write for, for TV shows I already knew so I didn't have to create things whole cloth and I read lots of books and I took lots of classes and went to lots of seminars and sat down a few times and I made a few starts, but to this day have not completed a single screenplay. Not for lack of trying. Uh, for years I was a computer animator in video games and I co-wrote a chapter on a particular thing with the uh, then tech director of South Park. And I got off the phone with this person and I thought, wow, that would be so cool, I could do an animated cartoon, I've got the software, I've got the skills, I can do this. Came up with a few ideas, came up with a few characters, didn't animate a single frame. So that was a little disturbing. Like, oh, I've got equal parts of this. And the problem was that my creativity was there, there was evidence, but it wasn't consistent. It wasn't universal. I couldn't apply it to all of these other things. But I realized there was one area where I was reliably, consistently, predictably creative, which was improv. That again, I have gotten up, done hundreds of shows with very little walk in and, what are we doing tonight? You're doing a musical, great. What else do I need to know? Sing when you feel like it. And nobody's ever asked for their money back, so okay. How do we get that consistency? What was the difference? Well, I didn't have to look too far to find other examples of where people were creatively, cons uh, consistently creative, and then something changed. If anybody's seen uh, Sir Ken Robinson, who, no relation whatsoever, uh, who did, a, he's a, a British educator, uh, expert on educator and an expert on creativity, and he found that children, especially before about sixth grade, are consistently creative. If you ask a child before sixth grade, you hand them a piece of paper and say, write me a story or, or draw me a picture, they go, sure, no problem, whoosh, here you go. And one of my favorite stories that he tells is about a, a girl who was in grade school who sat down and was drawing and their art teacher came by and said, oh, what is that you're making? And the little girl looked up and said, I'm drawing God. And the teacher, a little fearful of this, said, but um, nobody knows what God looks like. And without hesitation, the girl looks up and said, they will in a minute. So you gotta love that amount of creative confidence, okay? I'm going to define the undefinable and I haven't even gotten to fourth grade. That's fantastic. But then something happens around 
sixth grade, that we start becoming aware that not all of the pictures we draw will be deemed refrigerator worthy, right? That not all the stories we write are going to be fantastic. We start becoming aware that others might judge our work. And then we start judging ourselves as a way of heading off that judgment that might come down the line. And we develop inhibition out of it. So this judgment, self-judgment, inhibition cycle. It's a protectionary thing. And after sixth grade, you ask a child to write you a story or paint you a picture, you'll hear things like, I'm not a writer or I'm not an artist. So it just, as opposed to even trying, they just immediately define themselves as not creative or not creative in a particular area. Now, I think after talking with people and, and doing some investigation of my own, I think almost everybody has creative impulses of some kind or another, whether it's starting a business or uh, how many people sing along with their favorite song in the car and maybe add their own little flourishes to it. Hmm? Yeah, exactly, up until the point somebody notices you, right? It's great in traffic until you look around and see that one person watching you, and then all of a sudden that goes away. So there is that piece of, that judgment piece that all of a sudden, oh, I gotta, oh, it pops out of thin air. Okay, I've gotta stop being creative. So I wondered, and in looking, is that judgment, is that inhibition, is that the only thing that really keeps us from being creative? Well, interestingly enough, maybe. There's a lot of science behind right now that indicates it may be, that there's that judgment of right from the beginning, whether this is gonna be good or whether that's bad. A gentleman by the name of Dr. Charles Lim, who's a uh, neurosurgeon, currently uh, in San Francisco, who has been conducting studies. He's read uh, two studies over the past few years where he got improvisers of various disciplines and put them in an active MRI, which is kind of a video scan of your brain. You can watch change in real time. And the first time he got musicians and rap artists, and currently he's working with actual improvisational actors, some people that I actually know. And he put them in an MRI and he measured them making stuff up, okay? Improvisational, improv improvising a jazz solo, improvising a freestyle rap, something like that, measured their brainwave activity. And then he said, okay, now play this rote piece of music or play this, you know, read this particular poem that's already written down. And he measured that activity. And he noticed that the difference was when people were being creative, that they, the inhibition centers of the brain almost shut down. He, reclined, he described it as being almost in REM sleep, okay, which was very unusual. Uh, and then when there was a, they were reading something, which was probably fairly boring, he said he didn't make it terribly challenging, those centers lit up. Because there's a way to get it wrong, right? If you're reading something that's already recorded or written down off a piece of paper, there's a way to get it wrong. And especially under those conditions when you have, you're in an MRI and there are several scientists looking at you, the pressure is on, right? Kind of if we, you had just done that one, two, three exercise, and we said, okay, let's do it with everybody watching these two. You know, you probably would not have been able to go as fast, probably would have made more mistakes. So there's a lot of indication that that judgment, self-judgment, inhibition, is actually what kills creativity. Now, in the study that Charles Lim had, by the way, I mentioned he's doing this with improvisational actors. He hasn't released those studies yet or the conclusions yet, but the, so far, the patterns are almost identical. So three different disciplines, effectively, of creativity, almost identical results across those disciplines. So how do we deal with that? How do we get judgment out of the way? Well, one of the things, we've actually developed some exercises in improv to be able to do that. Uh, and I want you to imagine for a moment, if you were at a circus and you saw an aerial act, a trapeze artist or a tightrope walker, and that person did something wrong, and they fell 30 feet into a net, we're not going to kill them, we're going to be nice to them. And th they're not hiding that, right? They're under scrutiny by everybody there. They're not hiding the fact that they accidentally just fell 30 feet. They can't blame that on, you know, Phil in accounting or something like that. If there's anybody, if there's a fill from accounting in here, it's a different fill from accounting. But how do they get back up out of that net? What happens at the end of it? They pop back up, like, wasn't that a fantastic fall? Thank you. Okay, so they're, they're more inclined to go back up on that trapeze again. But they, like, celebrate the fact that I just fell 30 feet and wasn't it beautiful. So we're going to do a little exercise, and this is something we've developed. We could call a circus bow uh, in improv uh, that I would love everybody to do. So everybody, stand back up. And I want you to, for a moment, pretend like you have just won every 
medal in the Olympics ever by yourself. On the same day, you just won ever Oscar category this year by yourself and the Super Bowl on a team of one. Okay? So take that, take, spread your arms out widely. Thank you very much. And you're going to take a huge bow to your adoring public that watched you do all of this stuff. And it's grand, huge bow. And when you bow, you're going to say, I failed. Okay? So do that now. One, two, three. I failed. Turn to somebody on either side of you. Make eye contact. Bow to each other grandly. Okay, great. Turn to somebody on the other side. Even if they're across the room, make eye contact. Bow to them. Great, thank you, go ahead and have a seat again. Uh, we do call that a circus bow. By the way, I've done that exercise many times in, with, I've done it with CEOs, and it always elicits laughter, even though there's nothing particularly funny about, I failed. Uh, but it's a, that release of tension, it's that inhibition, that judgment thing that's sitting up there, kind of taking a powder going, oh, okay, you got me there, we're good. It's that release of tension of looking at somebody else and going, oh, thank goodness, you too? Ooh, I've been holding that in for years. Thank you so much. So instead of getting rid of judgment, what we can do is reduce the sting of it a little bit. So if we're not as afraid of it, if we're not, it doesn't have as much impact. That's really what the circus bow is about. By the way, the shorthand for that that we do as we throw our hands up and go, woohoo. So everybody practice that just right where you're sitting, okay? So one, two, three, woohoo. So yeah, it's one of those things, again, it's actually, it's a pattern disrupt for those of you who are neuroscientists out there. It's as opposed to getting in those usual patterns that we get of like, oh, I've made a mistake. I better hope nobody saw it or how can I fix it before anybody comes in? And just going, whoo, okay, I own that. Let's get rid of that mistake energy and then we can move on. Statistically in the NFL, uh, quarterbacks throw either no interceptions or two or more. They almost never throw one. Once you get in that mistake energy, it just sticks with you, okay? So, great, wonderful. We can reduce the sting of judgment. If we could just get rid of judgment altogether, then we'd be wildly creative, right? Well, maybe. There actually are people, thanks to the miracle of the internet, uh, we see exactly what somebody without judgment looks like. There are thousands of them out there. We see people producing fantastic amounts of content. Not necessarily the greatest quality, however. Judgment is there to help us refine the process. Uh, I get lists from time to time of you know, the 10 funniest people on Instagram, or the 10 funniest people on Twitter, and I generally go and look and not so funny. Yeah, exactly. It's generally, I, you know, I hate to say that. I want to support people like that. Uh, but it's generally people like pointing at something and shouting very loudly. And then they do another video next week where they point at something else and shout very loudly. Okay. Um, I had a friend who, after the last presidential election, was very upset and recorded an album of protest songs that they were going to raise money for the DNC and this was going to be huge. Now, this person was not a great singer and had been playing piano for about three months, but accompanied themselves singing. And I have to, and I have to admire them for doing, you know, the gumption to get it done, but not the greatest collection of songs in the world to inspire anybody. Uh, and then afterwards, they were like very surprised that this thing was not a billion dollar seller and wasn't making Adele reconsider her career, you know. Uh, so if we can get rid of that inhibition, yeah, we are wildly creative, but quality isn't necessarily there. And we've seen this again, there's a, there's a, uh, a group at the University of Colorado called the Humor Research Lab, also known as CURL, uh, that did a study about chemical suppression of inhibition. The, very basic that you get funnier when you have a few more cocktails. That's the fancy term. Chemical suppression means a few too many cocktails because it does suppress the inhibition centers. And they did this study of having people go up and tell jokes, take a drink, tell a joke, take a drink, tell a joke, take a drink. And sure enough, they went up. They thought they were funnier the more cocktails they had. They ranked themselves as friggin' hilarious. The people who were watching, however, ranked them as less funny. The wines literally do that. Okay, it is, it's a really funny graph. I encourage you to look it up. So we do need that judgment to come in and help us refine what we do. The problem is when judgment shows up too soon. Sometimes it's our friend. Okay, ooh, that skunk looks nice and fluffy. Maybe I should go pet it. Judgment shows up and goes, oh, the skunk might not be very receptive. Thank you, judgment. Really appreciate that. We go, I have an idea for a novel. Judgment goes, it's not going to be good. Not very helpful. So how do we delay judgment? How do we put it, you know, say, okay, go over here until I need you. Because the wonderful sentiments about uh, unlearn what you have learned or start with a beginner's mind, those are fantastic sentiments and they're great intellectual concepts and they're absolutely right, but they're very difficult to do. 
we can't just forget that stuff that we've been trained a lifetime to do. So part of that that we just did with the circus bow is taking that sting out and putting the judgment genie down the line. Okay, no, 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 that go back in the lamp just for a little bit. We know you're going to show up later to help us refine things. So how do we start without judgment showing up and start building on that creativity and be able to insert judgment at the right time? Well, that was where uh, I started the, I, actually the, uh, the name of this program uh, that uh, it's, it's right in front of me. I don't think you can see it up here. Uh, I came up with the title of this, which is I Got Nothing. That's the whole title of creativity for me. And that came from a friend of mine in improv. We were going out on stage at one point in time and sitting backstage waiting for the, the lights to come up. And he leaned over and he said, I always feel like my best improv scenes are when I go out and I think I got nothing. Literally out in front of the stage. And by that, I mean, oh, we always have something, right? We don't sit down and go, I'm going to create something. What? No idea. Could be a song, could be a pony. I have no idea. We always have that idea of the form it's going to take. And in improv, we might have a little bit of an idea from the suggestion we get, as we get suggestions from the audience very often to start and to surprise us, to prove to people that we're not making these things up backstage and then presenting them as though we just created them on the spot. So if we can start from that idea of nothing, meaning no expectations, meaning I'm not going to go out and I'm not worried when I go out on an improv scene about it being funny or being good. I'm just going to look at what's right in front of me. And that's the second step, is start with the obvious. Okay. What that means is what's right in front of you? What are the things that you already know? How many people have heard the phrase in writing, write what you know? Yeah, a lot of people. And that's kind of the best bad advice I've ever heard or the worst good advice, I'm not sure which. Because most people take it to mean write about what you've experienced. But if we did that, then we'd never have Game of Thrones. We'd never have Star Trek. Nobody's been on those ships. Nobody's ridden a dragon. But we can change that and say, write the parts that you already know. Oh, I, want, I really would love to. I, I know I like fantasy. Well, what do you like about fantasy? I love people that ride dragons. Great. I'm going to start writing about dragons. So we start with that stuff that's right in front of you, the parts that we already know, and the judgment doesn't creep in. It goes, oh, okay, I can't argue with that. You do like dragons, you do like fantasy. In improv, we're always working as a team sport, too. We're never alone. There's always somebody else out there with us. And we're always, we're looking to bring them into the scene, whether it's our scene partners or audience members. Uh, and at this point, actually, I would love to ask, can I have a, a, somebody who, uh, who would be willing to come up and volunteer briefly to help me out on stage? I promise you will have to do very little, and your self-esteem will leave at least intact, if not enhanced. Anyone who, who could come up and join me? Come on up. Yeah, thank you. What's your name? Cheryl. Uh, can I have a hand for Cheryl? Thank you, Cheryl. <laughs> the leather jacket. Come on over here, Cheryl. And uh, we, we've never met before, correct? No. Okay, you're, you're not an improviser? No. Terrific. Even better. Fantastic. Uh, so I'm going to give you this. I think you may already be on. Uh, and what we're going to do, I'm, I'm actually going to create your very first improvised scene. I hope you don't mind. I'll do most of the work if you don't mind. You okay? Okay, good. And what I want everybody out here to do, <coughs> excuse me, is uh, look at Cheryl for a moment. I'll make you slightly self-conscious. I apologize. And as opposed to uh, trying to think, you know, if you know Cheryl, saying, oh, that's Cheryl doing such and such. Just look at, uh, you can imagine Cheryl as a character in a movie with just what, you know, the way she's standing. A character in a movie, and think about what kind of movie that is. Is it action adventure? Is it romantic comedy? Is it, <laughs> exactly, you're adding to it. Ooh. <laughs> I, I'm sorry, it's a photo shoot. I didn't mean that, I just realized that. Uh, but what kind of movie it is, and what kind of character would Carol be within that movie? Okay, so I'm gonna create an improv scene based off of absolutely nothing except what I see, okay? So, uh, these are your kids in the gym class here? That one is. That one is? Yeah, that's a hell of an athlete there, uh, Coach Barnes. <laughs> Seriously. <laughs> I've been coaching soccer for a long time, but that one down there is a hell of an athlete. Hmm? Well, it's a puppy. Well, it's a puppy. <laughs> wow. Huh? That puppy looks a lot like a kid. I would well, not know. What breed is it? Well, it's Halloween, so it's a... Oh, uh, I yeah, see. Did you dress the puppy up as a kid or the kid up as a puppy? I'm not telling. Can you tell? I'm going with puppy dressed as kid. You got it. Oh, uh, well, that's great. Uh, so we'll stop there. Great. Give, uh, give her a hand. Thank you very much for creating your first improv scene. So again, I just took that stance, basically, that, you know, that she would have and somehow went, oh, we're in a gym class watching these kids play. Uh, start with the obvious. 
And then we get to that thing I started with before at the very top where those two words that I mentioned, yes and. And this is actually where we can keep creative, uh, the creativity going, but also be able to add in a little bit of that judgment. Because we're not, with, with yes and, we're not looking at creating something that's funny or brilliant. We're looking at judging, did I add to that thing that was right there, agree and add a little. Yes and means exactly that, agree and add a little. In improv, if we say no, which can be our first instinct, especially when we're moving into something that we've never experienced before. You know, there's a reason why, you know, children around the age of two learn, the first word they learn with authority is no. Because it's the first amount of control we have to affect our world. The smallest bit of effect we have around our circumstances, no. So if we say yes, we allow things to go forward, but we're not really participating in them. If we say yes and, it's like, okay, it's gonna go forward and I'm gonna agree and put something in and add to it. I now have skin in the game. So if somebody comes out in an improv scene and goes, here's your pizza, and somebody goes, why are you holding my hubcaps? We're not gonna get very far. If somebody comes out and goes, here's your pizza, and somebody goes, yes, it smells delicious too. Well, you look very tired. Would you like to come in and have a slice? Now we've got to start. We've got some place to go. We're not just in argument. We're just, get hubcap pizza, hubcap pizza. Uh, we can start moving forward from that. So I want to do another exercise now. Uh, we'll let, let's get everybody up and uh, find somebody to be your partner for this. It could be the person you did one, two, three with. It could be somebody brand new, entirely up to you. <coughs> and we're going to do a little exercise in yes and. I want you to remember a trip that you took, an imaginary trip that you took together. So one person is going to start by saying, remember wherever the location is. And by default, I would say, if you don't have an idea, just say, remember Mexico. Uh, because I have done this with groups that somebody went, remember Mars. And that was as far as they got because they were afraid they knew nothing about Mars. So keep it simple. The destination itself is not that important. But the first person will say, remember Mexico, for example. And the other person will say, yes, and. They'll start with those words and add a detail to it. Remember Mexico? Yes. And remember how blue the Pacific was. Next person again will add to that, add a detail to that. Yes, and it was so blue, I felt like I was blue f and perviated. I just made up a word. Okay, so keep adding yes and, yes and. So keep adding a detail to what's already there. By the way, there's another saying that we have in improv, which is bring a brick, not a cathedral. So, you know, the, the ocean was so blue. Yes, and I'd never seen blue like that. That's a brick. We're adding to it. Yeah, remember how blue the ocean was. Yes, and the great god Quetzalcoatl rose from the ocean and conquered the world, and now we are mad. That's a cathedral, okay? And it's a way of wrestling the idea. You put so much in that it wrestles the idea back to you. So go ahead, one person start with that remember wherever the destination is, and then keep going yes and, yes and, and add a little. Agree and add a little to what's already on the table. Okay, go for that. Okay, thank your partner, thank your partner. How many of those, how did, the, did those trips surprise you with where they went? And the thing that, <laughs> I heard somebody over here say, oh yeah, there's an interesting story, we will talk later. Uh, how many, if you're just adding those little things, that's the nice thing again, we get past judgment by agreeing and saying, okay, yes and the ocean was very blue, yes and the sailfish were jumping. Our brains are not gonna go, oh hang on, judgment, let me rope that back in. We're making those small incremental changes that can move up. And all we're judging is, did I agree and add a little to that? So we're reducing it to just that piece. Uh, comedy writers have a tool uh, that they call a list of 10 for almost anything. So let's say I was writing jokes for uh, Stephen Colbert's opening monologue, and I'm given a particular topic. I would start by sitting down and writing 10 jokes. 
But my goal is not to write 10 good jokes. My, jo is to, my goal is to write 10 jokes as fast as I can. Keep my hand in motion. And if I get to the end of that and I have 10 really crappy jokes, but they're 10, I've won. Brain goes, well, you did what you were told. So remember way back when we did that one, two, three game, I said the goal was to go faster, okay? Make mistakes. And we change the goal and change the focus and give judgment. It's kind of, well, judgment, I know you wanted a steak, but here's a sandwich to chew on. So we give it something else to judge whether we're actually doing the right thing or not. And then we can go back later on. The big judgment will come back at the end and we can start refining that process, refining our novel, refining our business, refining whatever it is that we're, uh, we're putting in. And, re and again, yes, and, yes, and, yes, and. Yes, and, by the way, is, has been shown in brainstorming meetings to be extremely effective, much more so than the standard brainstorming meetings. Has anybody been in the meetings where you bring, they bring everybody in and somebody goes up to a whiteboard and they go, I, I just, yeah, just shoot out ideas. There are no bad ideas. And they stand up there with a marker by the board and somebody says an idea and the person at the board goes, I'm going to put that down as this. Yeah, pretty much everybody. But, and what happens is not only are, have we said that, yes, there are bad ideas, but we've just said that was one of them right at the top of the meeting, and it becomes very difficult. Where if it's just add an idea, what if it's blue, what if it's green, what if we name it Charlie, what if it can fly, what if it toasts, uh, anything like that. We can roll out ideas very quickly uh, without that judgment that we're adding to. So I want to sum up this process of that consistent creativity, and then tell you, actually, I have used this. I've experimented with this myself recently to prove that I could do it. One of those creative failures that I talked about, I went back and said, can I do this? Uh, so we're going to, again, the, the woohoo, circus bow, we're going to lessen the sting of judgment. We're going to start from nothing in terms of expectation. We're not going to say, I'm going to write a good novel. It's, I'm going to jot down a thousand words. I'm going to do a list of ten. We're then going to start from the obvious. What do we know? What's the things that we already know that are there? What are the things that we can observe? Then we're going to yes and that. We're going to agree and add a detail, agree and add a detail, agree and add a detail. And we know that, again, judgment's going to show up later on, and so we can rinse and repeat. We can repeat this process. And I literally did this this past week because I said, I've got to prove this to myself. Uh, I've had an idea to write novels for years. I've never been able to do it. And I said, well, time to eat my own dog food, uh, and sat down and went through this process. And within a day, I had a full outline, and within two days, I had 10,000 words. I was really, I surprised myself. That kind of once I got that, and there were a few times I had to go, deep breath, let's go. But I would really remove the, the sting of judgment, start from nothing in terms of expectation, build off the obvious, yes and, rinse and repeat. So to wrap up, I would, I'd like to do one little more demo, something I want to leave you guys with some like profound knowledge of some kind. We don't even know what that is. But to do that, uh, can I have three people that would come up and join me briefly on stage? You'll have to do, again, very little. Uh, but uh, I promise we'll take good care of you. Only three. Not every, don't everybody rush the stage at the same time. <laughs> come, come on up. Yeah, come on up. There you go. Great. Yeah, come on up. Terrific. What's your name? Crystal. Let me have a, a round of applause for Crystal. What's your name? Zach. 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 Round of applause for Zach. And your name? Scott. Round of applause for Scott. So we're just going to do a real brief panel. You guys are going to be, if I can have you stand side by side, very briefly, uh, we're going to do a, a very brief talk show. You're going to be our expert. Notice I said expert singular, not uh, multiple, because you're going to be a person with three heads. Okay, so it'll be, when I ask questions, you'll answer one word at... Perfect. And actually, I'll give you this little, if you can, can you hold that in the middle? Okay, great. So uh, if I were, you can always repeat the question. It'll always start with you. Just find that if you say yes and find that next word that makes semantic sense. Uh, so for example, if I were to ask you uh, what your favorite color was, you could say my favorite color is. Uh, so what's your favorite uh, flavor of ice cream? Great, cherry, wonderful. It's a great flavor of ice cream. So we're going to do this very briefly. What is a piece of knowledge that you would love to leave here with today? A piece of expertise that you would love, if it would make your day if you walked out of here today with? The ways to make the world better. How to make the world better, okay? So good afternoon and welcome to Making the World Better Daily, the talk show where we always make the world better on a daily basis. And we have with us an expert in making the world better today uh, who needs no introduction, but I will introduce them. Would you please tell us your name? 
Mark, everybody. Mark. Uh, yeah, Mark, let's see if you can turn on your microphone there, Mark. Uh, Mark, who is, only goes by one name, kind of like Cher or Prince, uh, because you have done so much. Now, what is uh, the best advice you can give to somebody for making the world a better place? Always loving. Be always loving. That's a wonderful bit of advice. Now, what would be another, if you were to say what's changed your life the most, what would that be? Meditate. Every. Detail. You. Can. Meditate every detail you can. Be loving, meditate every detail you can. And that, what is that phrase? Actually, I've got you a book right here. Could you tell us the title of the book that is coming out? The. Only. The what? Book. You. Meditate. The only book you meditate. Hmm? Every other book you cannot meditate, but this one you can. Everyone, let's have a big hand of applause for Mark, our world-changing expert. So thank you guys very much. I'm, I'm over time. Thank you for sticking around with me. I hope you have a fantastic conference, uh, and I hope to see you again. So thank you very much. I wish you a great cookout. Thank you. Thank you.